Good evening and welcome everyone to Artist Talk on Art on Monday, December 4th, 2023. Thank you for joining us. I'm Miriam Deutsch, the ATOA Programming Director. Uh, founded in 1974, ATOA is the art world's longest running and preeminent forum. We are now in our 49th year. Our archive resides at Archives of American Art of the Smithsonian. Our archival collection has surpassed 8,500 artists and 1,000 panels and dialogues. You can see our YouTube channel, um, Artist Talk on Art, to view over 100 recent Zoom recordings. Comments made, made by our presenters do not necessarily reflect those of ATOA. Please join us on Monday, December 11th at 7 p.m. for a program, How Women Artists Changed Everything. Two of the authors, Eleanor Hartney and Nancy Prinsenthal of Writers of uh, Mo Mothers of Invention, The Feminist Roots of Contemporary Art, will discuss the history of contemporary art from a feminist perspective. Tonight, we are featuring Expressing the Feminine Divine, a discussion between artists Damali Abrams, Katerina Lanfranco, and Hiba Shabazz. Damali, the glitter prince pr priestess of in, is a New York City-based artist. She attended the Whitney Independent School Program and earned an MFA from Vermont College of Fine Arts and a BA from New York University. Her work has been featured in Art Forum, Women in Performance, a Journal of Feminist Theory, and on the blogs of Art 21, Fresh Milk, and many others. Abrams' writing has been published by Harlequin Creature and Women's Studio Workshop. She has received a fellowship and artist residence at numerous galleries and organizations. Katerina Lenfranco is a New York City-based artist and professor. Len Franco teaches studio art at Hunter College, which is part of the City University of New York, and Parsons and the New School. Len Franco earned her BA in art and in visual theory and museum studies from University of California, Santa Cruz, and her MFA in studio art and painting from Hunter College. Her work is in the permanent collections of the Museum of Modern Art, the Kupferstück Cabinet, uh, Museum of Prints and Drawings in Berlin, and the Corning Museum of, of Glass. Len Franco is currently serving on the Services to Artist Committee for the College Art Association. She is the recipient of several awards and residencies, and her work is represented currently by the Nancy Hoffman Gallery. Hiba Shabazz, was trained in miniature painting at the National College of Arts, Lahore, and received an MFA in painting from Pratt Institute. Her recent exhibitions include uh, the Art Foundation in Paris, the uh, ICA in Miami, uh, Jeffrey Deich Gallery as well, a public arts commission for Rockefeller Center. And she has been written about in Whitehall Art Forum, MAG, Hyperallergic, Art Critical, amongst other publications. Shabazz has been an art resident at the Tang Museum, Mass MoCA, to name a few, and she is currently serves as a board member for Art Production Fund. So now it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Katerina. Hi, uh, thank you, Miriam, and thank you for Artists Talk on Art panel. Um, that's including you and Doug and um, whoever else is helping run this. Uh, thank you, Jackie, for inviting me and or inviting me to um, come up with the interesting panel idea. And I'm really glad that you guys um, decided on this one about expressing the divine feminine because it's it's a very, I think, pertinent issue and theme and I think it's also um sometimes a little bit hard to talk about you know it's it's a little bit in the area of ineffable and um mysterious um so it's it's nice to have the opportunity to speak with both 
Damali and Heba, who I think both of you, both of you, your work is amazing, and I'm I'm so thrilled to be on this panel with you, and I think really does a lot to um, support and um, celebrate the divine feminine. So, um, in my own work, I will be sharing a slideshow. Um, I've always been interested in the natural world and in fantasy and in science. And in, during my undergraduate, I, I encountered this concept um, of, you know, nature aligned with femininity and culture aligned with masculinity and the sort of um, pair, uh, dichotomy set up between those two concepts, like oppositional dichotomy often in, in um, our, our stories or allegories or um, just sort of the way we make sense of the world. Um, so I'm going to be sharing some work starting from when I first moved to New York um, and just thinking about um, how nature is defined through a cultural lens. Um, just a second. Okay. Um, learned how to do this today. Um, one second. <laughs> the uh, Zoom bar is overlapping another bar. Okay, 30 seconds, play. So, oops. One more time. Okay. So um, when I came to New York, I came for grad school at Hunter College, and I had been exploring how uh, through language, um, through cultural um, stories, females were aligned with nature. And I was really interested in using nature as a... Um, lens to think about cultural issues. So I was thinking about how we produce these beautiful, one of these projects was um, Fire in the Night Sky, these beautiful expressions of culture that are sort of violent and loud and what animals might be thinking of that um, and how these animals in, in the scenes are hybrid, they're invented imaginary um, chimeras. Um, and 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 they're only illuminated through the cultural projection of the light. Um, also, during this time, I was looking at uh, Baroque painting, studying. This was right before I went to Italy to study Baroque painting, high Baroque painting, and the drama, and the um, sort of sensational color. These pieces have um, forest fires with single cell organisms erupting from this space and these kind of geometric forms come up repeatedly in my work where they seem like decorative forms but they're actually building blocks of life. For my um, graduate thesis degree I did this really ambitious project where I took my early experience of working um, in the entomology department at a natural history museum to think about Latin framing and naming of nature as a way for us to understand and organize it. So this painting project is a diorama with three um, painted elements. And so there is evolution on one side and biblical creation on the other. Um, this fascination with hybrid animals is something that we can see historically in Greek and Roman mythological creatures, but it's also not, doesn't just exist in the realm of fantasy of unicorns and such, but, you know, there are contemporary versions of it in the terms of the source and this um, mouse that was uh, genetically engineered to hold an ear. Um, so this idea of like the extremes of nature and extremes of um, geographic territory came up as a central theme in this show that I did after graduate school called Below Sea of Stars, where I combined deep sea and deep space as one liminal frontier, because I felt like our knowledge was 
limited of the natural world to what we could see and know and how at the edge of this knowledge, I could invent an array of forms um, and plants and animals that might live there. I created these uh, paintings that I wanted to feel like they were expanding past the confines of the traditional rectangular picture plane. So I chose forms like these jellyfish forms that also seem like um, meteorites or celestial forms. I was interested in how they're both existing in dark, deep, you know, um, spaces. Um, but this idea of like expanding past the traditional confines of the rectangular picture plane also came up in um, this piece that I did. It was a site-specific painting called Tomorrow Dreams of Neon for the Swan Song Show of the Andrew Edlin Gallery location in Chelsea. And the show is called Anthems for the Mother Earth Goddess. And in it, I created a perspectival space along the wall with the, this arched um, architecture. And the idea was that these alien otherworldly plants were kind of reabsorbing um, architecture back into the earth. It was like post-apocalyptic, um, unnatural, you know, the questions like what happened, but this um, return of nature overcoming um, built architecture. And so I'm interested in feminist issues or in the contrast between what we see as oppositional. This show, Human Nature, was a sculpture show. Um, this was at the Grace Building by Bryant Park. And this piece in particular was a juxtaposition between PVC piping and plumber um, epoxy and then crafting and gems and um, using construction uh, string to make macrame type forms. In addition to my painting and sculpture, I also have done quite a bit of curatorial work, um, which I think, you know, is really uh, a way of expanding sort of visual and cultural community engagement um, and just kind of having a deeper relationship to other people's work. I have also written quite a bit um, for the art blog and for POV arts. And then this last um, article was on Firelay Baez's work and feminist icons in um, black culture. This was a show called Mystic Geometry Circling the Square. And I um, created a worldview based on the platonic solids that I then made into these portraits. And I wanted to take something really simple, like simple building blocks of life geometry and create a worldview with them. So uh, choosing the uh, five platonic solids plus the sphere to illustrate a range of seasons going from winter, spring, summer, fall, to uh, different times of day, dawn, morning, afternoon, evening. And then in them are embedded all these different symbols that reinforce that. So there's a color spectrum and music range and then esoterica from different religious or um, esoteric traditions like I Ching, runes, alchemy, and tarot. And so using natural forms in both a sort of scientific, decorative, and cataloging way to create a cycle, a work that represented a cycle of life that could be repeated. This was done, this really started after, um, fermented after the 2016 elections where I wanted to get a sense of a larger worldview. Um, in these, in this series, I also created these individual pieces that were very adorned. So you can see on the surface, they have sequins and gems and jewelry elements, and they're supposed to be these sort of object uh, totem-like forms, but they're all based on the geometric structures of growth patterns in nature or bubbles or just uh, very mathematically occurring elements in the chaos of nature. Again, taking the contrasts between those two areas. A subsequent um, body of work was called Talk to the Moon, and this was in a, on for a show in Atlanta, Georgia. And this was a very intuitive project. Um, I ended up making this after I got married for a second time and had sort of this bigger 
family with exes and stepchildren. And it was just a, a very complicated um, situation. And I also realized that the role of the stepmother or the second wife was fraught in our cultural um, milieu. And so I wanted to create these really powerful pictures of strong women. I thought of them as goddesses or portraits. And so the one on the right is this conflation of um, Diana and then a self-portrait of me in this very kind of almost carved sculptural, very like uh, strong and iconic in terms of structure. Um, right before the pandemic, I intuitively moved into wanting to um, embody, have my paint embody nature instead of illustrating or being a conceptual representation of nature. So there was a lot of spraying and pouring, using actual leaves and plants as stencils or stamps. And I was dripping paint and there was pieces of fabric and string only later realizing that they were the size of um, masks in the pandemic. So these two are also from the uh, Talk to the Moon series. And this, I was building up the surface and and had they were really intimate in terms of scale. And then the hands piece on the left is called holding hands. And it was kind of this idea of like how much as artists, we rely on our hands. Like they're just um, this sort of meditative, reflective um, pause. During the pandemic, I think like a lot of people just feeling really isolated and, and, and imagining places you want to go to or sort of distant lands, just kind of traveling in the mind. Um, and so I made up these landscapes and based on, you know, some natural forms that exist, but kind of making them more sort of visionary in terms of the color palette. Um, and this is more recent work. This piece on the left is Fever Dream. And it was made actually during the height uh, when my daughter was suffering from an illness that I didn't know what it was. We couldn't figure it out. And it turned out after I'd worked on this painting in studio that the central like purple cluster or orientation, it came to me that evening that I just painted the illness that she had, which was scarlet fever. And I looked it up and it was, you know, the under microscope, it looked like that. Um, and these are two new drawings that are actually up right now in Connecticut. Um, and I did a whole series of floral drawings that are invented that um, basically mean like to rise, like flowers that rise up. So I chose very concrete, again, linear, um, hard edged lines to express this sort of strength in a feminine form. Um, and I, this is the last slide. Um, and I just wanna say in finishing this, when I think of feminine, it's not uh, gender specific. I think of feminine as something that both men and women and non-binary people have within them um, and that it's a co compliment, just like we have a yin and yang compliment from a, a Chinese um, cultural perspective. There's different compliments and that um, the feminine is something that um, is part of a balance in, in any human's experience. So I'll just stop that share. And that's just to give an overview of my work and sort of where I come from when we go into this discussion. Thanks. I just realized, I think Damali was supposed to go first. <laughs> But it's, I'd love to hand it over to Damali now. Hi, no, it's totally fine. Um, let me share my screen. Hi, everyone. I am Damali. Uh, I am Damali Abrams. My name is Damali Abrams, the Glitter Priestess. Is it going into full screen? Okay, here we go. And so Damali Abrams, the Glitter Priestess, the significance of Glitter Priestess is, uh, the reason why I go by that name is because my work is about art as a healing practice, 
an art as a spiritual practice. And I was researching these ancient priestesses in different cultures who use everything in the service of healing, art, music, nature, plant medicine, herbs, sexual energy, anything that's available to them in the service of healing. And I felt like, okay, that reflects where I want to go with my practice. And so uh, I also am a Reiki practitioner and do a lot of work with herbal medicine. I took a course in herbal medicine in 2003. And since then, I've been bringing that into all of my work as well, including my art practice, which you'll see some of that. Um, I just want to acknowledge that December 4th is my grandmother's birthday. She passed a long time ago in 1993, I believe. My mother's mother, today would have been her birthday. And also my aunt Sylvie, who is my mother's sister, died on this date in 2004. So I thought it was perfect that we're talking about the divine feminine on this day. And these are two um, powerful matriarchs from my matrilineal line, from my mother's side. And to get started, I wanna pull a card from the African Goddess Rising Oracle card deck. Um, can't see what you guys are seeing because my screen is broken, but this these cards are made by Aviola Abrams, who's my amazing sister. She's an author and she's been doing work around the divine feminine for a very long time. And uh, these cards accompany this book that she wrote called uh, African Goddess Initiation. But I just wanted to pull a card for us for tonight. And oh, the card is Queen Mother Nanny liberation so i won't read the description but liberation i think is appropriate so i'm going to show some of my more recent work uh starting with this piece which is called how do you measure pleasure it's the piece on the wall in the top right uh, i just wanted to uh, i showed some shots of the piece at an event so you can get a sense of the scale of it it's uh, four and a half by 13 feet. And the Zuckerman Institute at Columbia has this program where they invite artists each year to propose uh, to propose a piece. And then they commission an artist to work with the neuroscientists who are at the Zuckerman Institute. So my theme was pleasure. And I was able to meet with neuroscientists in their labs and to see, to talk with all of these different amazing scientists about how their work relates to pleasure. And they shared their research with me and it was a really amazing experience. And then I made this piece inspired by seeing the visual charts that accompanied their research. And that piece is still up at uh, the Zuckerman Institute, which is on 129th and Broadway in Harlem here in New York City. And this piece is currently installed at King Manor Museum, which is in Jamaica, Queens. And this piece is about Black history in Queens. And I'll show some detail shots. Um, King Manor Museum is the house of Rufus King, who was one of the founding fathers who signed the constitution and he has a home in Jamaica, Queens. So this is one of the detail shots. And I use a lot of archival documents in these collages that I've been doing recently because um, I really wanna highlight different histories that are being forgotten or erased as this area is being gentrified. And so, the aesthetic, the aesthetic on this piece, you can see there are, uh, there's like heart shaped doilies, there's lace. So I really wanted it to have the energy of an old scrapbook or junk journal or photo album um, and the aesthetic of like, <laughs> um, appropriately the aesthetic of grandma's house or an auntie's house. So there are lots of doilies and some you see some prints of doilies. Uh, it's a mixture of spray paints and 
it has velvet and lace and um, here's an article about when the journalist Gil Noble came to Rochdale Village in Queens. That's another shot of that. And there's a also the article that says Wright's Mark Sleeve's Grave is about that exact location where the museum is. And it's an article that says that there is a Black man buried somewhere in that park who uh, was a slave and uh, his grave is not marked. And this piece is called From Genocide to Gentrification, Northern Boulevard. And this piece is, um, this piece I created at Flushing Town Hall, which is on Northern Boulevard. And while I was uh, doing some research about Native American histories in Queens, I came across all of these articles about Northern Boulevard and when it, when they were expanding it, there was a Native American cemetery there that was in the way of this, um, of their expansion. So they were trying to figure out how they were going to get rid of all of the bodies. And um, here's another article about when the Jamaica train was being built, that they found the remains of another Native American cemetery near Queens Boulevard. So there are just all, and you can see here the, to the bottom right where it says Indians bodies blocking traffic offered for sale. That was when Northern Boulevard was being expanded. So there's, there are all of these articles from the 20th century that are about, that speak about Native Americans in a very uh, disrespectful and insulting way. And that show the way that genocide and Con colonialism and colonization are an ongoing project. And it's sort of like, um, it just, it, it's never ending. Uh, this is another article about the cemetery and, and what they're gonna do. And then this article that says, old Indian burial plot with colorf colorful history now is site of stores. This was written about uh, 10 years after they were, they successfully got rid of this pesky cemetery that was in their way and decided to write an article celebrating how much better it is that they got rid of this musty old cemetery and now have a shopping area instead. And that's just more, um, I try to combine contemporary ephemera with the archival documents. Um, so you see like the tow away zone sign is from my neighborhood where they're suddenly doing all of this construction because all of these new people are moving in and it, there's uh, suddenly a sense of urgency to repair things. And um, so the next section is I'm going to share this series that I've been working on uh, about of Black Mermaids collages. And so... Um, this just is, uh, I've made a little list of throughout the African diaspora, some of the mermaid figures starting on the continent of Africa in various regions. There's Mami Wata in Guyana. Um, my family is from Guyana in South America. And uh, for those who don't know, Guyana is geographically in, in South America, but culturally and politically, it's considered a Caribbean nation. And so uh, Water Mama, Water Mama is what she's called in Guyana. In Suriname, which uh, is formerly Dutch Guyana, she's called Water Mama. And uh, in the 18th century, uh, the worship of Water Mama was um, outlawed because enslaved Africans in Suriname were saying that Water Mama told them that there were certain days when they were not supposed to work and they were supposed to worship her instead. And so from that point on, she was outlawed. Uh, then we have the River river Mama in Jamaica and La Sirene in Haiti. Those are just a few examples of mermaid figures throughout the diaspora. This is a piece I made called Blood, Coffee and Tears. And um, it's part of a triptych and the title of the triptych is self-love spell triptych. And so I made 
the piece in three parts. This one, Blood, Coffee, and Tears, is about learning to love the shadow sides of ourselves, the parts that we hate about ourselves, the things that we hide from ourselves or other people, and and um, learning to love that those parts of ourselves. And so it is Blood, Coffee, and Tears are actual materials that are used in the piece along with um, locks from my hair, uh, a lot of plants uh, with different uh, aligning metaphysical properties. There are some detailed shots. You can see some of my locks. You can see some of the plants and the paper that's dyed with blood and coffee. Uh, there are a lot of mirrors in the piece and mirrors have a lot of different uh, spiritual significance in different practices. But in one book I read that people use, you can hang a mirror outside of your home so that if anyone's directing negative energy at you, it bounces back to them. It's kind of reflected back to them. And this is the cover of an artist book that I made called Obia Man Meets Fair Maid. And it's a combination of my artworks with my father's writings. My father wrote a book uh, called Metigy about the history and culture of Guyana. And so I took a page from that book. This is a Pronto plate lithography print on coffee dyed paper with some collage pieces on it. And this is the uh, title page of the book where it's, this is the cover of my father's book. And I wanted to show where my influences come from culturally and how much, uh, what, when I started to do the series of mermaids, a lot of people didn't understand, don't understand, aren't really into it. Um, and so I wanted to create this book to show the cultural influences behind a lot of the work that I do. So here's a page from his book on the left, and then you can see one of my collages on the right. And uh, it's talking about a figure called Olhaig, which is, uh, kind of vampire figure who sucks the life out of babies in Guyana. Uh, this is another Pronto Plate lithography print that I made at Robert Blackburn uh, Printmaking Workshop. And it's it also has Shinkole and what else? I think it's layers. Oh, it's a watercolor monotype with Pronto Plate lithography on top of it. And then on the right, there's an article about how when Guyana was British Guyana, it was a British colony and African spiritual and religious practices were outlawed. Uh, my father talks about how when he was younger in Guyana, there the British police would come around and do raids and they had to hide their drums and hide their candles because it was illegal. This is in the 1960s, up to the 1960s where it was illegal still to uh, practice African spirituality. On the left is, uh, this is another a layout from the book. So these are two of my collages. The one on the left is called Mary is Sparkling with Good News. And I, I wanted to make a black Madonna and child mermaid. And so it's Mary oh, when she's pregnant. And then the piece on the right uh, says, all we do is win. And I took these three, la three ladies out of, I don't remember if it was a Doctors Without Borders catalog or it was like a kind of like go to Africa, like African tourism catalog because I was taking images from both of those. So apologies because I don't, I don't remember, but um, I wanted to take them out of that context and, and put them in a more celebratory frame. And so, and also the, it's interesting Katarina was talking about the ocean and outer space and the mythology behind my mermaid series is that they live in a space where the sea and outer space meet, imagining that the depths of the ocean where no human has ever been and the depths of outer space where no human has ever been connect and that, you know, the deeper you go into the ocean, you'll reach outer space and the further out into space you go, you'll come to the bottom of the ocean and that is the space where my mermaids live. Uh, this is a page about bush medicines in Guyana, which are herbal medicines. And then there's a recipe that I made and embroidered uh, third, eye, third eye opening oil with mugwort, rose, and amethyst. 
and this uh, another page from my father's book about bush medicine continued and then on the right there's this uh, little teen from a queen's parenting magazine and they had a, a they had a an issue that was specifically geared toward teens and so i turned him into a mermaid with a mud cloth tail and his t-shirt says you have the right to feel safe in your own body because he reminds me of my own godsons and nephews and how little black boys at this age, we have to start having conversations with them about be careful how you behave in public. You might just be acting like a normal child, but other people will find you threatening. Police might find you threatening. There might be situations that lead to violence where you just think you're being a regular kid and other people, because you're black, think you're scary. And so, um, so yeah, so looking at this uh, little beautiful black boy, I was thinking about those things. And that's why his shirt says, you have the right to feel safe in your own body. And then it's also a universal message that I think a lot of us can relate to. This is another um, pronto plate lithography, Shingo Lay piece um, with a, on the bottom, Kanye West mermaid and another page from my dad's book. And then this is another one of my collages that says, please touch my soft pink chakras. And it's overlaid on a page from um, my dad's book as a pronto plate lithography print. And fair maid is the term for the mermaids that live in the black sea water in Guyana. Uh, because of the silt in the water, the water there is very dark. And so, the idea is that mermaids live in blue seawater and fair maids live in the black seawater. This is a pregnant Serena Williams mermaid. And um, it says, it's okay for me to have everything I want and more. And here you can see that she is in outer space. Um, I'll quickly go through the pages of this. This is a zine that I made that was published by Harlequin Creature. And it's a also, it's um, risograph prints, partially, and the rest is uh, just regular black and white Xerox, like um, kind of traditional zines from the 90s, if you're familiar. And this is a recipe for full moon charged water. And then on the right, there's a collage of Jean-Michel Basquiat and Janelle Monet mermaids, imagining if the two of them were contemporaries and friends and space mermaids together. Uh, this is lavender wine self-love potion. This one is uh, enchanted lavender and rose water. That's a mugwort and selenite oil for enhancing psychic powers and psychic protection. Like the same little boy. This is rosemary oil to protect you from negative energies and entities. And then in her tail, on the right, there's a mermaid, a uh, Willow Smith mermaid. And her tail is a page from the book Jambalaya by Louisa Tish. And it's describing Yemaya, who is a Yoruba, in the Yoruba pantheon, Yemaya is an Orisha of the sea who's often depicted as a mermaid. is for lavender and rose ice cubes and then that's just my bio on that same collage and that's this uh this zine was published as part of their social justice series which I really loved that they found that, that it was appropriate for that because that is the lens that I see my work through as well and then um, our final image is the Queen of Christmas, Mariah Carey. Uh, I made this piece in 2018. It was Christmas time and it was also Mercury retrograde. And um, it was just perfect because I had this image of the planet Mercury. I had Mariah, just a little space sea fairy, um, Queen of Christmas. If you, you haven't heard All I Want for Christmas is You, go listen to that immediately after this. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you, Katerina, for inviting me. And thank you for artists. Thank you to Artists Talk on Art for having me. That was great.
Wow, I didn't know about your deep sea and outer space. I, I always thought about that too for my project. It's like bending the spaces and connecting them. Very cool. Um, yeah, I didn't know about yours either. So that was very cool. Yes. <laughs> and stop sharing. Hi, I guess it's my turn. Um, so Katarina, we spoke about sharing my screen. Could you, would you mind just walking me through sure. that process? I have the slideshow. Have open. It ready. So you yeah. can just press the green button at the bottom. Green button and um, keynote, share. Perfect. Yeah. I'm going to go to play. Uh, play. There you Perfect. go. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, okay. So, hi, my name is uh, Hiba Shabazz. And um, so, the way I'm going to have this talk is. I'm just going, like the slides are going to change by themselves. I'm not really going to go into each one of them. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about where I'm from and um, my background. Um, so originally I'm from Karachi, Pakistan, and um, I studied art in Lahore at the National College of Arts, which is this old pre-partition school. And uh, over there, I studied um, Indo-Persian miniature painting. And um, before, like back in the day, Indo-Persian miniature painting was passed on from master to apprentice, but it was it was in a form of book art and it had died out. So there was one of two masters left and he bought it into our school system in the 80s. And that's how I got involved with it. So I'm just going to give you some background about um, Indo-Persian painting. And um, so it was a form of book art which um, developed in the East. And back then, artists would travel uh, for work. Like, there were no solo shows. And uh, we would just go where we had patrons. And usually the patrons were like kings who wanted um, books illustrated, like the Persian kings wanted the Shahnameh illustrated, and the Mughal kings wanted um, their own historical, like history illustrated. And also people, a lot of people couldn't read. So it was a way of conveying um, information. And um, Persian painting, Indo-Persian painting belongs to a broader genre of Islamic art. And so it's a little different from Western painting. Like Islamic art has certain signifiers, which you'll see if you go to the Islamic wing in, at the Met, which are usually, there's usually arabesque and um, there's usually uh, geometry, figuration, and a lot of calligraphy. And um, now the slideshow is really distracting me because it's gone like way ahead. <laughs> so, so, um, so yeah, so, after I moved to New York, uh, before I moved here, I was always painting women. I started painting women really young and um, I never painted faces. And this was, I, I mean, for me, not painting faces was kind of a personal choice, but like yesterday I ran into a Tibetan Buddhist in the hotel lobby and he was telling me, you know, in Tibetan art, they don't paint the face most of the time. And I never really saw it as a spiritual act, but um, I thought that was like an interesting um, intersection. I think for all of us here, after seeing The Last Two Dogs, I feel like 
a lot of our what we do is imbued deeply with uh, spirituality and um, I think for me that started with miniature painting I mean beyond being an Islamic art form uh, and having some rules like you have to represent a figure but you can't be realistic because you can't compete with God and there were no shadows and there was had to be a harmony and a beauty and all these like there were hands but uh, you didn't show any bones in the fingers uh, there was no perspective uh, beyond these like there was a certain aspect to painting which um, I feel came more from the Sufi traditions which just imbued the aesthetic and the training and the ritual and the meditation with a sense of spirituality and um, I think in many ways art is it's a way of it's a way of life and when you are involved in making which is deeply spiritual to you then your life also tends to turn into that direction as in it's it sort of mirrors each other art and life a little bit um so I started painting faces after moving to New York and um, this right here is an installation at the Rockefeller Center um, a couple of years ago. And by now I had began painting um, larger than life paintings, uh, which started as watercolors um, and tea, lots of tea. Um, and those watercolor and tea paintings turned into these cutouts. Um, and the cutouts have always been something I did for myself because they're so they're so transient in a way. Um, they're just installed and then I take them down and then I can remake them into something completely different. And I feel like that's sort of where the magic in those lies and the cutouts also came from a space from like an emotional space where I think I was trying to create like more beauty and safety um for myself in the studio so it was something I was doing for me I was kind of wondering why I put in these mermaid slides but after listening to you both like now I get it <laughs> um and mermaids have been a source of fascination um, for me because I'm I'm quite interested in how they exist across cultures, um, pre pre uh, recorded text. So I really have always felt like there's this collective consciousness that all of us artists. Uh, and humans who are not artists uh, pull from and like we all get the same downloads and then we all in interpret those in in different ways and um, I've noticed a lot of mermaids coming through in in art and literature and a part of me is definitely believes they're real my husband is on this zoom so he's going to be like you don't have to say that <laughs> so yeah and these are oil paintings so a couple of years ago um I uh, I was painting on paper and I managed to injure my my um hand and I had a lot of like rage uh rage in me and I the paper just couldn't couldn't take it so I went down to the local artisan craftsman and I bought the largest canvas they had, which was 96 inches. And I started oil painting and, um, you know, the first like dozen paintings were terrible, but it's such a beautiful medium. Uh, this is the most recent images 
uh, from the studio. I've been working on these wood and oil cutouts. And uh, this one will be up at Art Basel um, this week, if anyone figured out how to hang it. And um, yeah, so this is just sort of what I'm doing right now. And I'm going to stop speaking because this slideshow is ending with the slide. So thank you. Okay. Thank um, you so much, Eva. That's how, how do I unshare my screen? Oh, yeah. You just, um, you should go to the very top and just stop share. Should give you that. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I just thought, uh, I don't know if this is standard or not, but if anybody wants to ask any specific questions about what you've just seen, we can do that. Otherwise, we have some discussion topics that um, we sort of talked about earlier that um, I can I can start on. And then also, if you want to, you can always put your um, questions into the chat. Um, so I think for one, my, my, uh, page closed, but that's okay. I can open it. Um, but I, I think that it's interesting that, um, oh, there's a question from, from Deborah, but I, I think, it, I think it is interesting that you, cause I, in previewing your slideshow before there weren't as many of the mermaid images and so it's interesting how they've emerged um deborah was asking hey but can you talk about why you use yourself as the model that's what yeah. the question yeah. yes i can um so i started um painting when i was i started drawing myself when i was really young like i was um not even really probably a preteen and um I was uh I suppose I was I spend a lot of time on my own growing up like my parents are very traditional and I was usually just at home in my room and I just really just drew myself because that was my point of context and I thought a lot about uh drawing other women with time and um turns out there's a real lack of nude models in Karachi so we had this one um, wonderful Russian model Jenny growing up uh, who used to come to a private art class I managed to take um, but mostly um, I just always drew myself and that's just how it became and also because I was always working with um the nude body as in I love clothes but they didn't interest me in the painting context and living in the Islamic Republic it would have been like too risky for someone else for me to draw them so I used to draw myself and I used to just leave out the face and the face really came in, um, I would say, after, like a couple of years after I moved to New York, um, I started painting my face, but she was always in profile of just like the miniature paintings. And then it was years after that, that that face kind of turned to um, sort of look back at, at the viewer so it was sort of a whole process that came along from a faceless body to a body with a face I hope that answers the question yeah that was I think that was pretty thorough I was wondering about that just because um it isn't the most tolerant context you were at in terms of the female nude and like, um, and so I think that the anonymity of keeping the face first blank and then to the side makes a lot of sense. It's an interesting transition too, because if you like connect it to ideas of, um, you know, the male gaze and the female nude in Western 
art history, there is um, that difference between, you know, um, Titian's Venus Dorbino versus Manet's Venus. And it's a lot about the pose, the return view or the t return gaze. So it's it's like a it's a confrontation and um, empowerment, the change of the stance. So mm -hmm. Caitlin writes to all, do you consider the collective act of your art practice also part of your spiritual practice? And in what way? Um, Damali, I think you started talking about this. I mean, I know you started talking about this in your presentation, um, but can you talk a little bit more about how your art practice is connected to your spiritual practice? Sure. Uh, so, yeah, the reason why I go by the name Glitter Priestess is because art for me is a spiritual practice and a healing practice. And for me, in the work, you can see um, some of the pieces are very much in trying to manifest something, trying to call something in, trying to let go of something. Um, like each piece is a prayer in one way or another. And each piece is about healing. And I also see all of those as activist gestures as well. Heba, Heba what about you? So I think, um, I think doing what you love in general is very spiritual and I think that I feel um, like creating which is what a lot of us do is so connected to spirit as well and um, also kind of the topic of this talk which is about the the divine feminine and for me, I try to be really mindful of the energy I bring into my space and into my paintings because I always feel like, well, this is an object I'm creating and it's going to end up with someone and I want to put like as much love or as much grace as I can into, um, into what I'm doing. I want to like transmute whatever is happening around me which might not be off you know like um my ideal uh situation or ideal world and I want to make it into something uh which is more beautiful and more um I don't know I don't know exactly how to say it but for me that is that that feels very spiritual like it's kind of a journey and I also feel like the more that I go into my own spiritual practice I mean I am uh I am Muslim but I also have a Buddhist healer and I study with a shaman and I read I, I take a lot of classes and um, I'm always really interested in how everything is so connected and I feel like that definitely comes out um in the art so I would say yes yeah um and I'll just follow up um in terms of my own work it's interesting because um I don't think that it was necessarily a, something in the front of the work like um actively trying to make spiritual spiritual art or um imbue it with spirituality but I think it is such a the creative act is such a um, mysterious multi-leveled activity that definitely connects to a collective um, conscious and to the subconscious and it's it feels bigger than every day and what's on the surface you know so it's kind of, it's like, it's spiritual and it's undeniable, like magic, um, as opposed to 
like an effort to bring that out in it. And um, I was actually at a lecture at um, a Hare Krishna temple um, relatively near to my studio in downtown Brooklyn. And there was a talk on Tuesday evenings. They have these Lotus Room talks. And there was a talk about the idea that making art is a form of prayer because it's the service and you're giving something. Um, and I just thought it's a really interesting way because it is an offering. Like we are offering something. And I think um, it was someone who um, saw my work. It was the mystic geometry circling the square um, project. And she's like, this work is really healing. And it's interesting because my intention wasn't that, but it comes across like it sort of emits that. Um and I think sometimes I tell my students this all the time, like you can't know the full effect of your work as the maker. Like it's through the making and the reception and the dialogue around it where that stuff gets extracted. And, you know, it's a little bit like, you know, what is my artwork going to tell me? Um, so it is, it is spiritual. I think um, also this idea of believing and knowing through empiricism or empirical methods, like art re does require leaps of faith, you know, to, to practice as an artist, to um, articulate a vision, all that stuff is, um, you know, you have to trust that, like, you know, suspend certain amount of judgment, maintain critical engagement and, you know, uh, it, it is, I think if you look at how um, creativity happens, there's like, it's sort of analogous to the belief and the faith that people have in a spiritual setting, you know? Um, so I was wondering, uh, I thought it might be interesting to share. Um, thanks, Caitlin, from all of us. Um, I, I thought it'd be interesting to share some of our art inspirations um, and, and talk about them because, you know, as artists, besides just the immediate environment that we're in, we've also been, um, trained and have gone to, you know, numerous shows and exhibitions. And, um, I think the three of us definitely engage in research too. So I just thought it might be interesting to see this. Um, so you can, I, yours is up first, Hippa, but I, I just, just put in, it's kind of a lot of images, but I think it's nice to listen to panels talk about artistic things with images. I, I love, I love Frida Kahlo. She's been a huge inspiration for me um, for a really long time. And I remember when we were choosing these images, we were talking we were talking about this image of Frida in the suit and with um with her hair cut off. And I think one one really important point uh to to bring about when discussing the divine feminine um is that the divine feminine is not it does not really have anything to do with being a woman. And most of us have a masculine and a feminine side. Um, and I love this painting of hers because Frida very, very like um, openly accepted her her mas her her masculine attributes and all sides all sides of her um and she had a, i think a fluid uh sexuality as well and i feel like um i feel like sometimes uh when we when we discuss um the divine feminine it's important to say that it's really about wholeness it's really about having having the balance to um an energy in this world which is has a more um i i'm gonna call it a patriarchal mindset 
Um, and women can have that, like women can have a patriarchal mindset and men can be feminist. So there's really no, like, it's not like a either or, or thing. My dad, my dad is a great example because I think from in him, I really, I really saw the divine feminine. I mean, the way he nurtured us as children, uh, fed us after school, you know, he was mom, dad, all of it in one if I was sick wake up in the middle of the night um and at the same time he also had this um he struggled with the patriarchal mindset because he knew it was how life was formed and he wanted us to be able to live in the world today but he also wanted like he's so nurturing and anyway now I'm going off on a complete tangent but I figured since we didn't really discuss the divine feminine that much I should just just talk about it yeah um okay thank you some more I'll continue um tamale you can talk a little bit about Anna Mendieta yeah um I I really love Anna Mandiera. I'm obsessed with her work. And um, her work is so connected with, uh, she came from Cuba during Operation Peter Pan, which was um, an initiative between the Catholic Church and the United States government. And the idea was that they were uh, rescuing all of these Cuban children from the Fidel Castro re regime. So parents uh, entrusting the Catholic Church and the United States government to find safe homes for their children in the United States. Uh, Anna Mandieta and her sister came here and uh, wound up in Iowa in the 1960s, two Cuban little girls. Didn't go so great for them, uh, you know, being dealing with a lot of blatant racism and abuse and being called racial slurs. And so a lot of her work is connected to being taken away. She thankfully was, uh, she and her sister were eventually reunited with their family and their parents here. Uh, but um, a lot of her work deals with that trauma of being taken away from her homeland and um, being uh, kind of smacked up against U.S. racism, sexism, and the way that gender and race uh, coincide uh, for for uh, Cuban, in their case, Cuban women, and so um, so yeah, I love her work because she often uses her own body and uses nature, and I and I also want to echo what Hiba was saying about the divine feminine and. Um, I also wanted to talk about it in my presentation. I forgot to, but yes, I also view the divine feminine not as gendered at all. I think that we all have a lot of different kind of energies within us. We have feminine energies. We have masculine energies. We happen to live in a world that more um, honors and respects the masculine energy, which the masculine energy is sort of the kind of pushing energy, make it happen, a go, go, go kind of energy where the feminine energy is more magnetic and is about like sort of pulling things in and um, is a more, um, I, I'm not thinking of the word, but I was magnetic is I think. Like is receptive. Yes, thank you. <laughs> is a more um is more receptive. Perfect. So yes. So and those are energies that, as Hibba was saying, and as Katarina also mentioned, have nothing to do with gender. All genders can express any and all energies. Thank you. Okay. Um. So I um wanted to talk a little bit about. Oh, sorry, Hilma F. Clint. Excuse the typo. Um, so this piece is called Tree of Knowledge, and this was one of the largest 10, um, or the 10 largest, uh, really large works on paper that was shown at the um, Guggenheim, I think, in 2018 or 16, around there. Um, and so she actually worked doing um, mediumship and sort of spiritual 
um, sessions, seances, even I think to like receive information and guidance and her work um, is considered some of the earliest abstraction. And she thought it was like messages from the spirit world. Um, but her color palette has a very feminine, rounded, organic um, quality to it. She did create a series of temple paintings that were very geometric and triangular, um, more architectonic. Um, but she's someone who I've been very inspired by and who I discovered while I was looking at this um, symbolic use of form um, and color palettes in my own work. Um, Charles Birchfield is another artist. I just gave a talk on his work. And this sort of relates to a question in the chat about uh, balancing curatorial work and maybe writing with art making. And I think most artists um, do, uh, or not most artists, a lot of artists do have other jobs and other ways of expressing um, creative endeavors. So I also write poetry um, sometimes. My nature poem series, each painting had a poem that went with it that almost felt like a prayer in retrospect, not intentionally. But Charles Birchfield is someone who I've admired and I spoke last Monday about his work in relation to sound. But these two pieces um, have this kind of decorative ornamental quality, fulvous color palette, um, the, the two, um, these are moths on the top left side of the, um, the top left painting part of the <laughs> uh, slide and they're mating and it's in a flower garden. And then this birch field, um, I hadn't seen this piece until I was working on the lecture, show all these seasons in one sort of phantasmagoric image. Um, and I think that the curating, the curating, as I said before, allows me to have like a really deep connection to people's artwork and to celebrate their work and to kind of find connecting themes and strains. Um, and then um, let me continue. My question, my question was really about, you think that it feeds, is the research feed your work and then your ideas, I guess, is what I was trying to ask. Uh, um, it's a good question. What? It's a good question. Um, so it, it ebbs and flows. Um, I first started doing major curating after the birth of my second child. And I didn't want to, I wanted to maintain the energy of creativity in my studio space and in my life. And so I turned my studio um, into an exhibition space and held really successful group shows. And then it ended with a solo show project that ended up going into a major museum in the Midwest. And I moved to Trestle Gallery. Um, but I think for me, it does feed, but it's also like, what am I doing? Where am I in my life? Because sometimes it's too much and I have to step back a little bit. So I used to teach, I don't know, at like four or five places simultaneously. And I've, I've cut back to two, two schools and that's sort of it. And I have, I saw a great Munch show, Edward Munch show, um, this summer. And I have on my um, dry erase board at home a it's a bit of a joke title but lunch with munch that I want to write <laughs> I want to write about his melancholia and you know the, the the curatorial choices that were done in the exhibition um, but it's really it's so much being an artist as I'm sure most people at this um, panel and this Zoom, no, it's such a balance about what feeds you and what drains you. Um, so this is like this kind of panel is really nourishing because I get to have a deeper understanding of two artists works, um, two artists, Hiba and Damali, whose work I really appreciate and who came to mind, you know, 
with bells when I was thinking about the divine feminine. But then as we'll go through the slideshow, I was thinking of other artists. Like I just saw this artist, Colin Brandt, and he has a show up right now in, in Dumbo and it reminded me of Bernard. And so it's kind of, um, it gives, I think, agency to thoughts that may not mature creative thoughts that may not totally mature if you don't have like a deadline or an outlet for them you know so it kind of creates a little structure and order um so yeah it's it's a ebb and flow but it is interesting I've just um entered into a graduate program in philosophy with an intention to go into a PhD program in philosophy at the new school with an emphasis on feminism and nature philosophy. So just actually, I had to stop the welcome new grad students Zoom to jump onto this Zoom. Um, so it is another uh, sort of supporting trajectory. So I've just sort of switched it a little bit um, in terms, but it's always been like a parallel whether it's curating and writing or academics or lecturing, but it, I, I I do feel like I can't go too far, drift too far or else the, the energy sort of goes out, 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 off center too much. Yeah, to seeing your art, it kind of, I feel like that kind of makes sense for you um, because it does feel like those things are almost tied together. Yeah. And, um I feel like there is uh there is definitely a side of you which is more maybe service oriented and art is something which is service, but it's also very at least the way I do it, it's very self-serving too. Yeah. So I just I really love that. I think that's gonna be so exciting. Like really I know I'm really curious about it. Um, but it's all like things are just sort of come up and re you know um reinforce that it's a good idea um but yeah i i brought up these two miniature paintings in the slideshow for you i don't know if you want to say anything else about the miniature painting i think your description was really interesting i wanted to ask there was one point you had a small palette in your hand that wasn't like a shell or something was it Oh, um, yeah, well, traditionally in miniature, um, we are taught to make our own paper brushes and our own paint. And we make we mix the paint in shells because oh. uh, it's a really tiny shell, like it's that small. Uh, we mix a gouache in it, um, which is bound with gum Arabic. And... Um, that paint basically lasts for a painting and then we make new colors for the next painting and if you run out you're in deep trouble because you can basically never make the same color again um and it's it's just a very old old-fashioned and kind of eco-friendly way of working i do have a lot of shelves in my studio even now interesting that's great that you got that very deep traditional knowledge um okay i'll just continue here um so during our conversation damali you lifted the, a book up um a few days ago and you were reading this book do you want to say it, something about it yes i'm still reading it i don't feel like i can it's my first time reading it also i don't feel like i can really <laughs> speak in an informed way about it but it's called Zulu Shaman, and it was a gift from my sister, Abiola, that she came across uh, during her own research. And it's written by a South African author who's talking about uh, the different pantheons in their culture and uh, a lot of a lot of different expressions of the divine feminine uh, that I had never heard of because I really I don't know anything about so. South African culture before this so but I would highly recommend it it's a it's a very interesting book cool one of the books that I read that was recommended to me by my friend Perry was goddesses in every woman powerful arch archetypes in women's lives and what was interesting is um Jean Bolin Shinoda Bolin goes through the different 
goddesses and what they represent. But this sort of one of the takeaways from this book is that you can call on the different archetypes and goddesses. So when you're at, at home, you know, it could be Vesta or Hera. When you're, you know, um, in sort of civil, like, say you're at court or you're in academia, you could call on Athena. Or, or if you're sort of in the woods and kind of have this um, physical prowess, maybe it's Diana or Artemis. So, and it was just a really interesting way to kind of align yourself with very powerful female archetypes to kind of help you think about what it is, like what are your activities and and how to go about it. Um, so I just wanted to compliment your book with another book. Um, and then you, we also just brought up Bell Hooks because you used to write your name lowercase and that's my association, but I thought it was really interesting. I just um, wanted to see what came up on, uh, you know, the v divine feminine and sacred masculine with bell hooks. And the sacred masculine is the counterpart, like a healthy masculinity. And in this, um, this person, Matthew Fox has a blog and um, I liked what he was writing that bell hooks it is an ally in an effort to detoxify our understanding of masculinity. All women ought to be because women as well as men can be walking around carrying a toxic as opposed to healthy masculinity. I thought that was really interesting. You know, this idea of um, both, like we are focused on the divine feminine, but the complement is the sacred masculine. Um, and I know we're kind of, reaching the end of our time slot. So I just wanted to throw in a few artists <laughs> that I think could have easily been in this discussion that are friends, colleagues, um, or people whose work, I just pulled this together recently. So it's, um, so here's Melissa Steiger. And I think that even, you know, if it, the, it's through abstraction that we see the work, but you can see by her titles, it's expressively about the divine feminine in terms of issues, Empress number three, and in the belly of the Empress and the divine feminine sort of connected to nature, growing, um, nurturing. Um, here's a good friend, Medora Fry's, Fry's work. And this is a major piece she did at the Atlanta Contemporary called um, Venus Looking Glass, and she's combining sort of industrial materials and nature materials and experimental processes. Um, Fred Tomaselli is, uh, I wanted to include a few male artists as well, just um, besides Birchfield, but Fred Tomaselli uses um, na natural elements. So these are collaged, either uh, flower petals, and flowers or pictures of combined with sort of an ornamental decorative aesthetic. Um, Ruth Asawa, who has a show right now at the Whitney that I'm planning to go to this week. Um, so this kind of crafting, um, nurturing, tending, I think both of these pieces show that. I also wanted to talk about uh, Marilee Chalice's work, an artist um, living, I think in Alabama in the South, and she, um, you know, has very mystical, magical um, paintings, a lot of sort of totem animals and eyes, and this piece on the right, fire goddess. Um, but then I was thinking, you know, people like Takashi Murakami also um, expressing the, the feminine divine through like the cute, the friendly um, with a little bit of a twist, um, so much so that it's like on the most uh, luxurious handbags being produced today. So this this um, uh, kind of, I don't know, this yearning for cute feminine um, is part of our culture for sure. And he's definitely... Um, you know, approaches that with this collaboration. And then um, there's a show up right now at Parsons honoring Romare Bearden's work. And there's some Micheline Thomas, um, large paintings, mixed media paintings. And I thought this one was really interesting, especially considering we're talking about um, 
Hibas pieces and the nude and the figure. And so this is an art historical reference to Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe by Manet that she then makes into a photo, mixed media collage and translates into a large scale piece. Mm. Um, Chelsea Heinrich uh, Brown's work I just encountered in Dumbo this weekend, but there's this sort of like careful um, tending you know, craft is often associated when, with women's work. And I've used that as a juxtaposition in my sculpture. I know you have that in De, in your work too, Damali, this idea of craft. And even in Hibba's, like, you know, the technical history of the miniature paintings. Um, and Colin Brandt's work is up right now. And it feels very sort of like a visual hug of a landscape, very soft edges, um, warm color palette, that magenta that is um, that Molly, you and I are wearing today. And uh, we're we're really at the end of our time. Oh, okay. Uh, okay so I'll stop the share. I just wanted to like kind of. Oh, right. thank you, Damali and Heba and Katarina for an absolutely fascinating uh, discussion and you're sharing your imaginative, inventive, very spiritual work. Um, I especially like the coda at the end, showing the influence of various artists and explaining that. So uh, bravo. Oh, thank you. And thank you for hosting. Thank you everybody for coming. Yes, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. <laughs>